Hey everybody, welcome to Houdini Hangout. Uh, it is the uh, 2nd of May, um, and uh, yeah, we're, we've got a guest with us tonight. Uh, should be a very interesting walkthrough of uh, some pretty cool uh, projects. I've already just seen a couple little glimpses of his uh, of the node networks and things like that. It looks like they're going to be pretty pretty uh, pretty crazy. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll get some some fun stuff to be able to uh, you know learn and stuff tonight. So, anyways, um, yeah, I just uh, got back from from Germany, so uh, I wasn't around last week. So sorry that I wasn't streaming, but um, got to meet. Hey Zach. Nice to have you and uh, Rigmaroling. Nice to have you guys both with us. Um, but yeah, so uh, I was in Germany. I got, I feel like I got some sort of European virusy bug thing, and I've been like achy and sick the past couple of days. So this is like an absolute gift that um, Mark is with us tonight. So it, so uh, I don't have to use my brain too much and can just kind of you know heckle from the back or whatever. But um, but uh, before we dive too far into anything, um, uh, some of you may have seen um, some kind of sad news uh, that came out. There was um, uh, a, a guy named uh, Ben Mears um, who uh, who actually passed away. He was part of our side effects uh, family. Um, this is uh, just a picture of of uh, Ben and uh, the rest of our crew. Um, some education people, some marketing people from side effects, um, and a couple other people that we're close with. Um, and, uh, he passed away this past weekend, uh, kind of in a, in an accident, um, motorcycle accident. But, um, uh, the reason I mainly bring it up isn't to kind of bring the stream down, but, um, Ben was kind of one of the people that encouraged me from the very beginning of streaming and, um, encouraged me to get my, to, to apply for the job that I have now at side effects. Um, and so, uh, Ben's right there in the middle. Uh, and, uh, I just wanted to, uh, just kind of send a thank you out to Ben for everything that he's done for not only me, um, uh, but the rest of the community. Um, if you're in the game dev world and you've done anything, um, for, uh, you know, with Houdini and game dev, uh, Ben has been huge on that. Um, and, uh, he's been with the, he was with the company from 2015. So, uh, uh, and would run the, the uh, a lot of the uh, the online you know social media presence and things like that. So he'd always be liking and retweeting and stuff. So there's a pretty good chance that if you found this through uh, some other me uh, means or through side effects, that it was probably Ben that sent you uh, my way. So yeah, it's a huge loss for us. But Ben was an awesome dude. Um, he's going to be super missed. I'm super glad that I got to meet him and know him. Um, and, uh, just grateful. And so I, I don't know, I don't really know what else to say, but just, uh, thank you, Ben. And to, for everything that he did for not only me, but for everybody that streams and, um, everybody that's kind of in the wider, uh, Houdini community, it's going to be a big, um, kind of hole to fill, but, um, yeah, that was that, that is Ben and uh, he was an awesome guy. So just wanted to put that out there for uh, everybody just to get a little behind the scenes on uh, what's going on there. Yes, there is also a GoFundMe. Uh, you can find that information through side effects page. Um, there's a little thing right on the front page and yeah, please. Um, he, he leaves a wife behind and um, so anything that you give will, will be passed along to her. So um, yeah, just an awesome guy and just, um, really going to miss, uh, having him around at the different events out there. But, um, so I just wanted to start off that way. I know it's kind of a little bit of a downer, but kind of just dedicate, um, you know, this stream really is, is, a, a f something that he did. So, uh, kind of getting us, uh, off the ground. So, um, but anyways, let's move on to, uh, maybe some happier stuff and some things that I think, um, we are all kind of more here for, um, I have Mark Fancher, um, with us tonight and, uh, he's going to be walking us through some of the, uh, XFL graphics. So Mark, welcome uh, to the stream and thanks for, uh, thanks for taking some time to do this. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm, uh, it's an honor to be here and, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, excited to look at some stuff. <laughs> cool. Yeah. I mean, the honor is, is, uh, all, all mine. So thank you very much. I mean, you've got some awesome stuff. Uh, I've seen, you know, the work that you guys have been doing for, um, 
you know, several years now at least and kind of been on my radar just in general and just you guys have been kind of putting out some awesome work with Already Been Chewed and um, just in general. So, um, yeah, it's it's awesome to be able to kind of see it all broken down. So, yeah. So what are your what are your thoughts for kind of how what you're going to show us tonight and just kind of um, maybe give a little tease for what we're going to see here? Well, do you want to see? Okay, so I have the uh, video, the YouTube video. I can throw that up. If Great. Yeah. Why don't you throw that up in your screen, and I'll uh, I'll kind of hand things over to you here. So let me. Uh, there you go. It is all yours right now. So I'm gonna play this without any sound on because I think it might be a licensed track, and I don't want to like get it flagged. <laughs> get me monet. Get me demonetized. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's cool. But I can just kind of talk over it. Um, sure. So I'm just going to hit the play button. And uh, this is a piece that we put together for the XFL for ESPN. So the XFL is like a different, an alternative to the NFL basically, but it's football. It's a version of football. And we just did this brand film. And a lot of these assets wound up being sort of used as cuts between um, different, you know, aspects of the gameplay. Like they would cut to this during a, like a replay or kind of switch back and forth. So some of these elements I worked on and I just thought it would be kind of cool to go over some of the techniques that um, I discovered or implemented while working on this. Cool. Um, so you can see it's a lot of Sims, a lot of black and white and a lot yeah. of um, movement. <laughs> sure. Sure. Um, just from like a creative standpoint, since uh, this is sort of the, uh, the world that uh, I come from as far as like in the, uh, you know, in the broadcast uh, and, you know, kind of MoGraph world, like what was the, what was the brief that you guys were given for this? Um, kind of how did this come about where, who, you know, how did that all, how did that all work? You know, it's, that's a good question. I'm not actually a hundred percent sure how we landed this job because I'm not involved <laughs> with that side of it. Sure. Sure. But, um, you know, my boss, Barton, and our sales uh, people, Donnie and Ariel, are just insane at finding clients. Like, That's I don't cool. know how they do it, but they just get cool clients. Uh, for I guess, like, what was what was the creative brief, like, that you guys were given? Were you given, like, graphics to work off of, or were you just kind of like, hey, play around and come up with some stuff? I, just how did that kind of work out? Yeah, it was really, it was cool. It was surprising because they had amazing style boards. I guess they have a pretty like hefty internal um design team and they cranked out some amazing style boards for us and we were like wow like these are in extremely inspiring um i should have grabbed a couple of them maybe but i don't know if i would be allowed to show that anyways but um That's a lot okay. of these boards are very close to it um very close to what the uh, style boards were that they provided us so it was a matter of like kind of taking what that image looked like and then imagining how imagining how we would form that image. So, um, for example, um, this knit right here, um, if I just kind of freeze right here, this is basically mm -hmm. aside from these like waves that come on the outside where you see the weave actually forming the style board that we got, like this portion of the frame is almost exactly what the style board looked like. I tried to nail that as, as yeah. closely as I could, but then form it out of nothing. So kind of using this type of a um, technique to kind of land on it. And then they said they wanted it to resolve to a shirt to a part of the Jersey. So gotcha. This okay, was, cool. So they, so they had some, they had some pretty, pretty uh, specific, you know, style frames and stuff like that, that they were, they had given you then. Yeah. And they, and we more or less like, we, some of them we hit pretty loosely. Other ones, we just sort of took inspiration and kind of took it in a different direction. Um, this one as well was pretty close to an example that they had provided to us where there's this rock in the background. Um, and this is sort of like, uh, I think the, the style board that we got was pretty much like, well, it was pretty much like this, except the X was aligned and we weren't like breaking the rock apart. But it was just like sure. sort of what, what kind of ideas do we get out of this? And so this is sort of one of the first ideas that I had for this was like, well, what if the, what if these letters um, come together and. Oh. Sorry there for a second. I think we might have lost Mark. Hold on one second here. Just. Let me try to reconnect with him there real quick. Sorry about that. 
Uh oh, I, I'm getting a I'm getting a message on the back channels here. <laughs> uh, let's see. All right, we'll get we'll get Mark uh, reconnected here. Give me one moment. <laughs> All right, well, we are back. Sorry about that, everyone. I guess we had a little hiccup there. Um, and I am going to just see if we get start to get some folks back in here. Yep, we're back. We're back. <laughs> nice. Cool. All right, so why don't you just go... F yeah, why don't you just go back from, <laughs> from where we were? Um, cool. And uh, we'll kind of we'll continue. All right. Yeah. Wait. So, um, okay. I got you. We're good. We're good. <clears throat> so I've got, uh, yeah. So this is really like one of the shots I wanted to talk about. And, um, really what we got was something very similar to this. It was like, it was this X, um, fully formed in front of a rock that was kind of like this. And so we just kind of grabbed a rock off mega scans and kind of rebuilt this. But one of the ideas that came to my mind when we were doing this was like trying to come up with a way that, to, to, you know, kind of build that frame and kind of work with it. And so really it is this, you know, kind of building of tension. And then these two halves twist and crack the rock at the same, with the same motion to kind of make that kind of right. impact like that. Right. So cool. we kind of have it come form, build a little bit of tension and then it cracks and then it kind of spreads out and then reveals a football behind it. And then um, that last part is just a, like another effect to help wipe. But um, basically the trick here though is the thing that was tricky about this is that we needed to do like time remapping and time ramping and stuff to like have those impacts and that speed up slow motion type thing uh, where we needed it. And so one of the things that was kind of cool and I explored this in a bunch of other ways in this project was like making this modular. So instead of doing a sim that cracks the rock and then waits and then spreads it away from one another right here using that force, um, mm -hmm. I actually did the sim in two separate sims. So I did this an initial sim where the rock gets twisted and broken. And then um, I could, so I could time remap that one uh, independently of having to go and, you know, run that sim, try and figure out what timing needed to happen with the slow motion to actually make it time up with this other piece that's coming down right here. So we can kind of take a look at. Yeah. Look at yeah. That. that sounds really interesting. Yeah. I'd love to see that. So this is like, not, I haven't cleaned up this network at all. So there's a lot of kind of extra stuff laying around in it. But um, basically, you know, we start with one of these um, mega scans rocks and I just go through and I think what I did here was grabbed a couple, uh, grabbed a plane and just sort of looped over creating some noises so that when I did a Boolean chatter in the middle here, it would actually have like multiple cutting planes kind of stacked on top of each other to create like an excessive number of shards on the inside like that. Um, so this is kind of a normal thing you do with, um, you know, any sort of destruction uh, setup is just try and make it so that there's lots of little shards in the middle. And then uh, here I just uh, kind of used a Voronoi fracture on those uh, shards as well to break them up even further. Cause sometimes right. when you do these like Boolean fractures, I don't know if you notice that, but you get these like shapes that look very planar and just, you wouldn't really see a rock fracture and have like this like concavity to it. And, or, or like, you know, some of these shards just look unbelievable. Like this one right here. I don't think you'd ever <laughs> see this, this part right here wouldn't survive. Like it would have to right. break at that at that point yeah so, yeah for sure i think you get these really odd shapes a lot of times and and it it helps to like double fracture and that's even what happens in the material fracture node right like that yeah that happens in there as well yeah it just sort of like recurses through it um and kind exactly. of does it again and then so yeah that's what this this voronoi was here it's just you really kind of get rid of almost all of that there might be some weirdness but it's just a lot harder to see and generally speaking the more pieces there are the harder it is to criticize what's wrong with it <laughs> <laughs> good point yes so uh bring those all back together let's see if i can see do you have class attributes i don't know if we have maybe we have names 
we can maybe look at some names. There we go. You can kind of okay. see that that like concentrated little cracked area in the middle is what we're going to, you know, that's what's going to do ma the majority of our sim work for us um, because the rest of it is just grouping. So I just grouped this side. So I grouped this left piece and this okay. right piece so I could animate them independently. And then here I just have a transform that does sort of the, whoop, just does a little twist on that one. Okay. And then this one right here grabs that other group and does the opposite. So whoop, just those two guys doing the opposite thing here. And then uh, with the RBD configure node, we just um, set the uh, bullet data so that everything except our two sides are set as active. So all these middle pieces here are active. And then in the RBD solver, you know, you get these attributes here under the properties. Um, right. active animated deforming and stuff. And then inside the bullet solver, we can just um, set a keyframe where we want that those sides to release. So you can see here, I've got my side groups, side underscore star. And then that says after frame 95, just set them to deforming and active. So that's just a way that you can animate your RBDs and then release them into the sim. So it'll be animating colliders at the beginning of you know the sim. And then after a couple frames, it just starts to drift along with the rest of the sim the way it would normally. So this is sort of uh, what that cache looks like. You can kind of see uh, we get those two rocks twist and all those chunks break apart. And then those rocks now are in um, just straight up zero G projectile motion, twisting around and so on. Cool. And okay. that's the end. Of, so that's the end of the sim. It just drifts and does that. Um, and we send that into a retime to make it go in slow motion. So if I pull up this animation editor, you can kind of see here, this is a retiming curve. So really right around the time where this crack happens, then it kind of just goes into slow motion. So this more shallow slope here kind of indicates that. Yep. Um, this is really how I like to, I don't know. There's so many ways to use the retime node, but I'm like a very much, um, I think it's from working in After Effects or something, but I'm very much like this frame equals this frame type of a person. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense coming from like a, a time remapping um, in in After Effects for sure. I mean, that that's how I would do anything, the same, any time remapping like that in After Effects personally. So um yeah, I think I think it's it's more of a motion graphics kind of mindset of how to how to kind of retime these and work with them. Yeah, for sure. And so like now we've got this, right? So we've got this right. and it kind of ramps into that slow mo that you see there. It's kind of hard to see with the cache playing back because it's not like fully real time, but mm -hmm. um you can tell that it's definitely drifting slower than it was before. Um, hey, I there's a quick question um, in the um, yeah. in the chat here. It says, "So the velocity of each piece in the sim is inherited from the transform nodes." That's the question. So I th I'm I'm guessing that I'm not, he, that I'm not exactly sure how that part of it works. <laughs> to be quite honest, <laughs> I think that it is though. I think that once it is released, it must know the position that it was in the frame that it was released, and maybe right. knows. I see what, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing what they're saying now. Yeah. Cause it just kind of keeps going in that zero G kind of momentum. Right. So yeah, yeah, that's, I, I, yeah, it should be that it, it picks up that velocity that's coming on that frame where it becomes um, active or whatever. Yeah. I'm curious. Cause I don't think I actually have a velocity attribute going in here. There is mm -hmm. no velocity attribute here, um, <laughs> but it could be calculating it inside the solver so i'm not if i i can just try and see if i can easily if i can easily see that it's creating velocity for those pieces then i can probably yeah so what frame does it like let go from that animation right frame 95 so right it says the release frame is frame 95 so if it's greater than the release so on frame 96 this frame right here is where it is actually yeah. switched over but if I look at my geometry, I wonder if my if my groups came through here. Let's see the group attributes. If I go through yep. and show side A and side B, these first two lines are side A and side B. 
Mm -hmm. And let's see if I can just hide everything else, show the group attributes and show the velocity. Yeah, I did see that there was a velocity there. Um, yeah, so it looks like it is it is calculating velocity all along the way. It's odd because it looks like it's not getting an X component to the velocity. It's just, but once, but once we reach, once we start cracking, we do get an X component to that velocity, probably because those pieces in the center are pushing it apart. But the twist I was doing was just totally axis aligned to, yeah. um, maybe. Right. Sure. So it's the, it's the pieces in the middle that are actually kind of pushing it apart in a weird way. Yeah. I almost wonder, huh. is it getting rotational? Yeah. So yeah, it's it is, getting yeah. a rotational um, component uh, calculated too. So it is, mm -hmm. it's nice. It's like if you're animating it, it's calculating the velocity on it as it would as if right. it were an RBE, but it's just not being allowed to do anything. And then mm -hmm. it inherits that once it starts yep. going off. Once, and once the active it. state is changed, then it, then it's able to kind of just float freely. And, yeah. and there aren't any constraints in the middle there, are there? Those are just, those are just um, just freely able to just kind of go when there's nothing being glued together or anything in the middle there. I, I meant. Yeah, I was just super lazy with that one. I was like, well, we're just gonna, <laughs> you know, we're just going to crack it real quick and it's going to be just kind of a quick thing. <laughs> no, but that's so, I think I think that that's a really good thing for people to like see and understand that like. Yeah, you could go in and do all these like really accurate, realistic things, but like just make it look good. You know what I mean? Like that's especially with with motion graphics. I feel like that is more often than not the number one thing that, you know, you get you can get hung up on. Right. So, yeah, I mean, and that's sort of like a lot of a lot of it, too, is like I could have done this and then we did the retiming and then, you know, math wise, you know, I without the retime in here, we could have tried to figure out when we're supposed to add another force to get this to like, you know, blast away to reveal the, you know, football behind it like this. Right. Yeah. This last part, like we could have, if you watch the rocks kind of push away from one another, it would have been really difficult to stack this on top. So it is kind of one of those things where if you kind of like cut the corners where you can and figure out a way to make it modular, you're way, yeah. it's way easier to focus on making one part look as good as it can and then move on to the next part and make that. Yeah. Look as yeah. Good as, you know? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I, I love it. Yeah. No, I think it's, it's great to, to see that. Yeah. That's cool. So like in that same uh, regard with the inheriting of the attributes. Mm -hmm. So like over here, this is where we do like another, one of these RBD sims. So we're feeding in this retime node right here. Okay. And then this RBD bullet solver is set to only go. This is set to start at frame 150. So it just brings in every, and I think what I had to do is I had to remove the active and deforming point attributes for this to work. Cause I'm not doing any releasing in this one. This one, I'm si it. simply just taking whatever the state of this object was, we've got the velocities, we've got the angular rotation, we've got all that stuff, we've got the names, everything from the previous sim, and we're just gonna inject that into a brand new sim at um, frame 150 is when it's gonna start, and then it's right. going to do its thing. And um, and how is that retime set again? It's set at just a static frame, or what is, is that what that retime was doing there? Um, This retime, sorry, my system is, cooking something <laughs> no problem <laughs> this retime is where that curve is that we we're looking at here so this oh, is oh okay that, okay got it got yeah. it okay and, and then it's just simply like we're just simply saying okay like when we get to frame 150 on this retime that's yeah. when we're going to start doing the this sim. yeah and all this sim does is take over from where this thing kind of left off now the thing that's cool about retime is that retime scales all the velocities uh you can see here um, scale velocities and interpolate rotation of normal square turn. You know, basically, it's taking all the vectors that were associated with whatever was going on with this geo, and it's interpolating them to be slower as well. So it's not like we're taking the original speed and injecting that in. It's coming in in slow motion the way we want it, the way we set it right. here on this curve. Right. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so from there... Once it comes in here, basically this this sim just kind of takes over, and you can see that initially it's just kind of going, but it gets um, pushed apart because inside um, I'm just going to try and get in here without cooking too anything too intense. But 
inside here, it's just a metal ball force just pushing it apart. And so okay. Yep. We could basically just choose like where in this timeline do we want to have this happen? And basically the logo animation was happening around frame 150. So that's when we're going to grab this read time uh, information, uh, throw it into the RBD solver, and then just add a force to push it apart right here. Cool. And so we've got these. And I think what I did was I may have done a little retiming on this one too. So uh, yeah, I was able to actually retime this cache as well. So this has its own like speed ramp to kind of like, like give it some oomph. So it kind of moves away and then goes into slow motion itself kind of like that i don't know if it was kind of visible but it does kind of like get pushed and then kind of slow down yeah in, no yeah it, G state yeah i <laughs> we always would joke that like ever everything in motion graphics right now has to have some sort of speed ramp and has to be in that kind of floaty state it's at some point it just it seems like it's like every, every project they're like yeah let's like slow it down really slow <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's like, it, it's so funny because it almost feels like when you watch it, it's, I feel like we're all so used to it maybe at this point, but I feel yeah. like when I watch something like this, when the logo comes in, I don't even notice that, but it just feels like it's what's supposed to be happening, but you don't right. even, I think it would feel weird if we, if I wasn't doing something like that to have that to match that ease of the logo popping in like that. Yep. I don't know. Yeah. Right. Cause, cause we're so used to seeing like in motion graphics, like things moving with, you know, with the right ease in and out and things like that. Um, and so to have the, the simulation move with that as well kind of makes sense. <laughs> yeah. It's just it's so, it's so weird. Cause yeah, you want all these things to be in tandem and almost like once you get them all feeling like they're moving in the right timing with one another you almost just like don't even notice it as much i don't know it's almost like it's hiding in a unified like yeah state. i would have ne if you would have asked me how you did that i just would have been like oh you just did one sim and then just kind of let it go really long but I, this is i really love the idea of kind of taking one sim and then pushing it using another sim. you know what i mean like it it makes so much sense to kind of like you said this modular approach to kind of working with sims yeah because like there were i don't know if this was necessarily the case for this particular shot but there were a lot of requirements to adjust the timing too so like we would want this to happen faster and a lot of times you can just throw a retime on everything and then you're good but um there were certain times where it's like well we might want it to actually come in and hold in a certain area a little bit longer and then instead of redoing a whole sim it would be more like just redoing one of the sims and just having this sim pick up from a different point from the other sim we know we got the other one the way that we want it we don't need to re-sim the first 150 frames or whatever you know right. 900 times until we get the next iteration correct you know right right yeah um so this this is a question that that might feed off of what you were just talking about here it says were the speed ramps added at the end of the whole animation or just at the end of each part so in this case, I added a, a speed ramp at the end of this first um, rock breaking. And then mm -hmm. I added another speed ramp at the end of this rock breaking in a way that kind of felt uh, right to me. And mm -hmm. then right here, I'm actually just switching between the two, sim the two sims. On frame 149, we just switch from one to the other. So you can kind of see like this is them both together. We just have this first one with our speed ramp and then our speed ramp on that one. Yeah. And because it's switching on the frame that we designated this RBD bullet solver to start simming on there, you don't see that there's a switch happening there. And, and, right. and for the sake of motion blur and attributes and everything, it, you know, after this switch, it appears the same to, you know, Houdini or a render engine or something like that, you know? Right. Exactly. And I think the interesting thing there too, is like it, it's, it's kind of like, I think a lot of times people try to do these super elegant things where they're like, I'm going to take all these pieces and like transfer all the attributes back and forth to them so that it's just all one stream of geometry and it doesn't switch or do anything weird like that. But like clearly this works and is way simpler than like trying to figure out how to get those transforms to fit perfectly back onto all of those packed pieces and stuff like that. Right. I mean, this is yeah. a more straightforward approach. 
Yeah, and I think like a lot of times I will, you can see over here, I did I did do, a, I sometimes do like to use this point cache function where it actually just right. like stores the points. But for whatever reason, I was having issues with that. And so yep. you can see I had a switch here where I just kind of abandoned that and just did the full, <laughs> the full RBD cache. So I'm not exactly sure. I wish I could remember what happened here, but right. sometimes it, trying to be clever, it just, it wasn't happening. And yeah, so, and there you are, transform pieces and all that stuff and then just nope we're gonna just keep keep moving right right past that yeah and it i mean and it's, a, it's a really tiny sim too i mean i think that this 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 cache was if i had to if i had to look it up i mean it's it was 500 megs so i mean right so it's really really small, really small for a sim you know yeah yeah yeah, I mean that's that's the beautiful thing about a RBD sim with all the packed geometry and everything. You're just really simulating points. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. So yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Yeah. So that's kind of the crux of it. I mean, the the rest of this shot was more or less um, adding the secondary particles. So there's you know the particles that kind of you know add a little bit of flavor, and then same thing happened here. So this this retime is referencing this retime. So this retime yep. is in unison with that one. Then it feeds into another sim. Same story here. This yep. pop sim gets fed in. This one starts at frame 150. And then we cash that out and then have another reference read time here. And then we have this uh, switch is also referencing this switch as well. So all the switching and all the retiming is just basically copied over here to the particle setup. So everything feels like it's all working together with the with the uh, timing and such. And and for the particle sim, um, did you do um, you didn't do any like debris sourcing or anything like that? You just did it just just like pop net kind of just from the the pieces somewhere on the pieces using a group or something or. No, I actually yeah I did use. Oh, you did source. use a debris source. Um, okay, there it is. Sorry, I didn't see it in there. Yep. Got it. Okay, cool. Yeah, so no, you're the using debris the... sources. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's a, um, it kind of it's, is solving, but it's it, it can be a little bit heavy doing the debris source, but I use it all the time with stuff like this. It's great. Um, yeah, I can't see it in action though. I don't know where it is. I think oh, it's because I'm maybe yeah, maybe it, there it is. There it is. Yeah. And just if anybody isn't like super familiar with the debris source, um, what it does is it looks at uh, the distance between these like neighboring pieces and stuff like that, and uh, as those distances as they move apart right they're going to create source points am i am i saying that right like it i'm just i'm yeah, trying to remember exactly, exactly how it works but okay yeah cool. it's like you specify a rest frame so the rest frame right. for this example is like frame 72 i could have probably given it a later frame but that basically is where and then it analyzes you know prim faces that are like close together if they separate yep. it will just instance these little uh points on there you can see them kind of showing up on the um on the faces of this geo inside like that. Right. Um, and then from there we can use that to, I, I'll add a little bit of velo velocity noise to them. And then that gets sourced into the pop net. So it's pretty, and I don't think, and when it comes to doing a zero G pop net, I, I don't think there's anything going on in here other than yeah. collision. So it's, <laughs> it's just, it's pretty just straightforward. With itself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. No, I, I love it. it. And those are the things too, that like you can add so much to a sim by adding some extra little particles or a little dust or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever to, to kind of add some flavor to it, that, that kind of put always helps to push it to that next level, I think. Yeah, for sure. And then, you know, I think a lot of times what I'll do is I'll actually, yeah, I'll take the, um, I'll take some of them. I'll kind of split this up. So I think right here, I'm just kind of making a random threshold. So I'm taking 10%, it looks like, taking 10% of those points and setting them to be uh, a group that I want to instance little chunks on. So a bunch of them are going to remain as particles when we go to render. Um, and I'm just going to set the scale randomly here. But then these are getting sent out to be instances. So if I go and kind of check, uh, let's see here. We go to our debris instances in here. This is just doing uh, the normal instancing setup. And I don't know if it's actually, I don't know if I grabbed what I needed here to show this, but let's just turn on debris instances and see if it shows up. Yeah, here you can kind of see that here what I'm doing is just instancing, grabbing more um, 
grabbing little rock chunks that I made, just extra rock chunks. Yep. And throwing them on these points and then leaving some of them to actually be points as well. So that kind of just helps fill in the gaps between, you know, what the big chunks of the RBD are. And then, so you kind of got these, you got these large RBD chunks and then mm -hmm. you add in some particles, but you add these instances in to kind of like fill in the gap between the large chunks and the particles. And then you get these little particles to kind of really be right. like a finer level on there. And that's yeah. kind of something I do on like all the RBD Sims is just throw extra stuff in there, <laughs> you know? And, and when you um, make those instances, you just like loop through some, like a little rock generator kind of a thing, or what do you, what's your, what's yeah. your go-to method for that? Yeah. So like in this example here, I've got a, a make instances right here. And this is right. exactly what you said. It's I'll, I just Voronoi fracture cube and remove awesome. all the faces, remove all the outside faces, center them, normalize them. And then this little thing blasts out over every frame, each one of these yep. pieces yep. and then writes it out to disc. So in our case, we use Redshift. Um, and so we'll mm -hmm. be, I'll be writing out BGO instances for the viewport and then redshift instances for the render. Cool. And yeah, these, you can see, this has got like, this has got like a crazy extra, a bunch of extra, like, you know, file path construction going on right here um, mm -hmm. that I've set up to kind of just automatically know how many pieces are coming in. So I can change this up and do send different things into this, but then I can like automatically just, you know, it'll know how many pieces, how many frames it needs to render. It'll write them out and right. same thing with these, with these instances and then if we cool. look over here at this at this instance thing right here this similar thing is happening at the end these two wrangles are linked to those file caches we were just looking at in the other network okay and so it is reconstructing a path to random instances from that folder based off of what parameters we set on that file path construction on the other one right and so I use this setup so much, but because it's so custom, I can't really make an HDA for it. So I have, if I, <laughs> if I, if I go over here and I hit uh, instance, you can see I got my instancing set up here yeah. and I just leave this as an object level node. And so I just dive in here and just copy these two things and okay. those two are, are linked together and I just bring it up here and paste it. <laughs> and that is a new instancing setup and we can break something else, but that is the basics of it. It's like, Oh, that's stored cool. In yeah. Level. And because and I find like I got to customize them so much that I don't, it, it it's hard for me to make a one size fits all HDA for it, you know? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and just, just for, um, you know, for my curiosity, I guess in this, in this sense with, um, with Redshift, um, instancing and stuff like I, I, I haven't used Redshift um, that much. I, I used Arnold a bit more, but with their instancing setup, basically you just need an attribute on a point and have some, some custom, um, object kind of parameter set in order to have it instance that geometry. And that's what you're writing. You're writing two different, um, strings basically inside of the instances there. Is that what's, what's happening? Yeah. So in, in here, uh, this one right here, the, ultimately all these strings are getting kind of smushed together to form this instance file attribute. Right. And right. If you, look, if you look at the geometry spreadsheet, it, it's going to, um, if I, I think I gotta see if I, I don't know if I have my thing showed up here. If my filters working or maybe I don't have points. Yeah. There's no, probably no geo yet. I think, right. Cause it didn't come into like, yeah, the there you something. go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. That's right. So if I hide all my attributes and show the instance file attribute, this big old chunk of VEX is basically you're just reconstructing a file path to the right. disk where each one of these pieces exists. Yep. And you can see there's a bunch of different types of pieces. Yep. For, you know, the piece four through 18 should be grabbed off the disk. And so it's doing that for the BGO pieces because when I have my display flag down here and I come up here, I can see them in the viewport. Right, right. Um, and now with with Redshift, you actually can render these as instances. So rendering them out as Redshift proxies and doing the same thing over here isn't like fully necessary anymore, but you just can't see them, you know? So right. Um, up here, though, there is an option if you did want to. Under the instancing tab, you can say instance SOP level pack primitives, and then it would render. Oh, these cool. Pieces. 
Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Okay, cool. So, so it it's sort of, that's sort of a legacy thing that you just have kind of left since you already have the setup built or whatever. Yeah, it I've I've had this setup built for so long and I it's <laughs> it, it's it's such a drag to do. Um every time you want to do it. I I might I got to the point where I was like I got to save if I'm doing something more than a couple times, I have to figure out a way to either save it or make it easily accessible and in this case it was one of those things where it would be kind of a lot to just open up another project and copy this out of it every time. So yeah, I'll do this object level thing <laughs> and just almost as like a way to just quickly save a couple nodes, a couple like a setup where I don't want, I don't necessarily want to make an HDA out of it, but I just want to be able to grab it and use it. No, it makes total uh, sense. Yeah. Time. Yeah, that's great. Cool. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. Yeah, those are those are some nice little tips too, just like with in like quick instancing and not worrying about what exactly the little pieces look like, but just kind of spitting out some little chunks and getting them more or less, you know, looking the way you want them to. Yeah, for sure. Um, and you know, it's cool because you could add more detail if it needed it. You could go in there sure. and, you know, in this loop you could add interior detail or you know, mm -hmm. remesh these and add noise to them or whatever. But in a lot of cases, I just use the regular bore noise and they look yeah. great. <laughs> They're little chunks, little pieces. Yep. <laughs> that's awesome. Cool. Yeah. So that's kind of all I had for um, this project, but I do have other project files we can look at that kind of go over sure. similar things. Sure. Let me, uh, let me just, uh, I will... It'll just be me for a second here while you're doing that, since uh, since you're you've got your uh, screen uh, set up there. So I'll let you do your thing, and uh, yeah, why don't you open up another another project and then uh, hand it back over to you? Cool. Do you want me to see if I can get my video stream back up? I I don't know if I my if I um, can share my camera. It's up to you. You can you can give it. Give it a shot. I'll go back on for a second here. Yeah, give it a shot. See if you can see if you can make it work. Oh. Uh, I, I see a black screen, but I don't see you. Yeah. There we go. All right. Let's <laughs> It might help to see the hand waves. I, I do know. a lot of hand waving as well. I totally get it. A lot of times I'll point at stuff and then I'll be like, "Wait, what am I You can't see what I'm pointing." Like, it doesn't yeah, make I'm any sitting sense. over here like talking about like the twisting of the <laughs> of the X and I'm like, "No one can see what you're doing, dude." I'll I'll just see if I can <laughs> all right well now now we got it back here I'll, I'll throw it up and you can uh this was the node network i saw before so i'm like really curious about what 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 all is happening back there so yeah yeah this one this one actually is continuing with the theme of like modular kind of like editing type of thing okay cool so um let me just find this is actually a transition element so what it is is it's like th this would be like shown between you know, um, I don't know, like a commercial and, uh, or like between a replay or something like that. So this right. black is all on alpha. So yeah. we cut from one, like we cut from like live to like replay after this, or we cut back from a replay to live after this. And so, yeah, That's this sick. section all black here is like, you know, a video of a replay. This comes in on alpha and just wraps it up. And then when it rips apart, we're back in live action. Or something like that. That's I've seen them use it like this, and you can still see this on TV. I think I don't know how long the season goes, but I've seen this one up on the screen before, and was like, ah, that, that was I did that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it goes by quick, right? It does. It goes so fast, and <laughs> like, and so like one of the things this really kind of continues on with that theme that we, that I've been talking about of like modularizing. Okay. Um, so in this instance, it was about, well, we got to get this right. So we've got this cloth sim that kind of wraps it up like this. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, okay, we can nail that. And then 
but could you imagine if we had to like sit through simming all of this just to tweak this sim right here the ripping apart Mm -hmm. So really what it is, is it's, it's this SIM is one SIM. And then we stitch to this SIM, which rips it apart. And even the threads are a third SIM. So this is just breaking normal constraints uh, that are invisible, getting this to rip yep. apart. And then we actually add, you know, these little uh, fibers onto the result of that SIM to create further tearing going on at the end. And, th and that's really kind of like one of those things where, I know like Vellum is insane. Vellum has so many capabilities when it comes to two-way interaction or making like super complicated constraint setups, but like that's great and all, but sometimes it's like really good to just have a two-way or a one-way interaction. And so I'm always trying to find one-way interactions. Like we don't need those fibers that are ripping right here to have any, we don't need these fibers ripping to have any say on what this movement is doing. I know I can break those constraints and get exactly what I want without extra hair sim gnarling it up. You know what I'm saying? So right, right, right. I do really enjoy, as, as powerful as Vellum is, I like identifying areas where I can kind of compartmentalize what's going on in the setup and get, get just abstracted away and not give it the ability to ruin the work I've done previously. You know what I'm saying? Yep, yep. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Kind of taking each step along the way, especially with something so complicated and quick as that, it makes a lot of sense to kind of split it up like that. Yeah. So um, this is, let me just get this out of here. We don't need that. Um, but yeah, this is sort of what that network looks like. And um, I guess quickly on top of all that, there was this kind of embroidery, which I actually did. I did the embroidery as, a, um, as Geo. And um, because Redshift and splines is kind of been a weird thing lately. I've not been, it's, it's tough because I do a lot of spline work with like weaving and stuff like that. But okay. um, I've found that with Redshift, it's just been working really good to actually sweep out actual geo. Um, otherwise I get orientation flipping. So I get, if I don't, if I don't sweep this out and, you know, pr pr specify the orientation using an orientation along curve and actually give it straight up geo, you'll see a little flicker in the rendering where these okay. tubes are actually spinning around their axis. They're kind of spinning around. Um, right. You know, yeah. Yeah. In yeah. Circles like this. And it, it creates this chatter, which is like really obnoxious. And sometimes, and the thing that's crazy about it is if you're doing a low res or like a low sample render, you'll think it's just a part of the noise and then you'll render the final and it's all. It's still there. Realize, oh. Yeah. It's actually a part of it, <laughs> you know? Oh, so, that's, that's mean. It's elusive and it can be a little bit maddening. So mm -hmm. I've just done the thing where you just, I just make it into fibers lately and it's not efficient, but it works. So, <laughs> it works I though. <laughs> Wait, yep. I, I, yeah, I had a project that I was doing one time with all this kind of stuff. And yeah, the, the threads were constantly just like, I think that's always an issue. Like in every renderer is like, having a million little embroidered threads and stuff like that is just can be a can be a pain in general so yeah and they it's it's just weird because like render engines at least you know I and I did experience in the middle of this project I was like I threw it in karma and karma spline rendering was working so nicely and I'm like oh gosh I wish we could switch to karma right now but you know you're in the middle of the old job like that you can't yep. really do much can't do it can't do it changing but i am i am i've been tirelessly um uh, working away at karma <clears throat> thanks to your tutorials and and everything and trying to get better at at usd because i do think that implementing that at work is something that i will do yeah. at some point in the future but i have to get comfortable with it first you know yay karma yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we've got some work to do with it as well i mean it's still still early days but um somebody uh uh, VFX man was just <laughs> joined the XPU gang. Somebody says uh, VFX man also said, wouldn't setting forward and up vectors on the curve help fix uh, redshift from trying to flip them like randomly. Yeah. So that's kind of what I um, have going on down here. Uh, I don't know exactly where it's happening, <laughs> but yeah, there's an, there's an orientation along curve here happening. And yeah, so I'm yeah. giving it an orient attribute or, or whatever 
but yeah. I haven't been able to figure out which attribute it is that actually keeps Redshift from doing the flip. So I just strong arm it myself <laughs> into, yeah. into a sweep. Um, <clears throat> now I, I, you know, that that's a good idea. I don't know. Like maybe I'm just using the wrong thing. Like maybe it shouldn't be an orient. Maybe it should be a transform. Maybe it needs to be named something else. For yeah. Redshift. Or maybe it's just, yeah. So maybe it's just like, uh, maybe it's just normal and up or something like that, you know, or, you know, maybe, um, maybe it has some sort of custom attribute that it might ingest or whatever, but yeah, that Orient should be the strong, like on the hierarchy of, of kind of Houdini attributes or, uh, yeah. Orient should be the strongest. So yeah, that that's, I, if anybody knows if, if one of those does hold it, that would be super handy because in this project, um, well, and also this is another thing with a lot of weaves, um, or a lot of like threads, sometimes you can just subdivide it so many times you don't see it actually spinning around because it's it's like a round two. But in this case, I actually um, wanted these points to be not round so that I could actually get highlights off of them. They're triangular and they're yeah. all kind of rotated at different angles. So I wanted some glints to happen in here and you can kind of see it. This renders a little bit noisy, but you can kind of see that it's doing the... Uh, like it there's like a varying amount of like reflection happening on some of those yep some of those threads yeah but um and that would be yeah. not that would never happen if they were round right yeah if they were perfectly round so yeah that just like allows for some um kind of like glints to happen in there to make it kind of feel like that embroidered silver um that you right. see sometimes on like garments yeah, and it gives and it gives variation between each each kind of um, you know each thread as it goes through there, so it doesn't just like that highlight doesn't just perfectly sweep across it, but it has some yeah. texture as it does it. Yeah, that's that's nice. I like that a lot. That's a good idea. Thanks. Yeah, and you can also like catch different um, highlights with the X portions that are facing in one direction than the other. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it's, so it's kind of interesting there. Yeah, no, um, it definitely is a nice nice little trick. Um, so yeah, that's not even like the, this was just the logo. So this, this is the logo <laughs> it's constructed using, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of orientation attributes along, uh, these curves. So I can kind of show here, we're just, um, grab the original logo. I think I peeked this one out uh, or mm -hmm. in a little bit so that I could kind of have it. And we just kind of randomize the, uh, normals of all the points that we're scattering, um, yep. onto it and just copy them on there and we get these little threads like that. And these had to be like kind of peeked out to make room for the logo uh, that goes inside of it. Uh, so that's sort of what that is. And then over here, it's a similar thing. I just um, grabbed these sections and I think I had to peek them as well a little bit, but then we scattered and added a little bit of noise, but they're all more or less pointing from left to right. But there's just a little bit of noise to kind of unstraighten them out a little bit. And mm -hmm. then we copy yep. same little stipple thingies on there as well. And that's sort of oh. how that logo is constructed. Uh, Lucas was just asking if you can turn up your mic a hair. Uh, let me see if I let me see if I can do that for you first, because that's probably more so on me. So let me let me check f real quick here. Um for sure. Nope, I've got you up all the way as high as I can get you. So if you can give, I'll give it a little, I'll give it a little, I'll give it a little love here. Hold on a second. Give it a little juice. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Lucas, for the heads up. I appreciate that. Is that a little bit louder? Yeah, that does sound good. Actually, yeah, I think we're good. Nice, cool. Um, so yeah, this that's sort of the logo construction, and this really just kind of gets point deformed along with the rest of the Sims and stuff. So let's kind of set that off to the side and uh, look at the other part, which is kind of constructing this Jersey. I mean, we call it a Jersey. It was basically inspired by the Jersey, which has a logo on it and some, you know, stitching. Um, but more or less, um, I just created a curve to kind of represent that, you know, area where it kind of has this little notch in it right here. You can see that right there. Um, and so this curve, and then we, take a grid and I just use that curve to cut the grid into two different pieces like that. And 
then we do some remeshing on that. Let's turn these normals off. Um, let's see if I can get, we'll split them into two sections. So we've got our top section and our bottom section. And here I'm just doing like some little adjustments. Like I have to move this, um, this upper one down a little bit so that they could have some region where they overlap. And then I'm going to add constraints in between those two so that they have constraints that I can break. So we can create that kind of tension of them being pulled apart or being pulled together. So those same, this sort of same constraint setup, is going to be used to pull the two pieces together for this first part right here. And then the same constraint setup is going to be used as actually like glue that can be ripped when we pull them apart. Okay. So that can kind of be reused. And that's sort of important also in maintaining like um, similar geo between the two sets of sims. Right. So we've got, we've got the groups, we've got the upper and lower group here. And um, here I'm just going to create um, an attribute uh, using distance along geometry that I can use to actually animate uh, a mask. And I think that if I check this out, this is, this mask is called mask. This mask is actually what's going to be used to tighten up the constraints to get the two halves to kind of come together at first. So that's sort of just a very basic mask that moves across the geo um, to help bring it together. And this right here is really the first part of the sim. I add a little bit of wind to it. And so one of the ways that I've been doing wind lately is I'll create a float uh, noise attribute and just kind of pass it through in the direction of the wind that I want. So okay. these really yeah. dark areas kind of act like gusts, if you will. Um, right. For lack of a better term, they just kind of gust a little bit. Um, and then here, just setting cloth constraints up and setting stitch constraints up. So the stitch constraints are like, let me just turn this off real quick. You can see these little blue dots are really yep. where it's kind of stitching those two sides together like so. And then I think this transform just grabs one of these sides and moves it away. So we're just moving one of these sides away. And then over here, we are transferring that um, mask attribute that I was showing you that we animated before. We're just transferring okay. that mask attribute onto these constraints. And mainly right. the constraint that we want to, want to map that onto is the stitch constraint. And that's gonna allow it to constrict or contract those those um, stitch constraints back to um, zero. So we've got, we get a stiffness mask here and then inside the vellum solver, we actually pull that in using this stitch stiffness right here. So the stitch stiffness adjusts the stiffness of these stitches based off of that um, mask attribute that's passing across. And then there's some other wind forces and this wind mask gravity is or this wind mask attribute is actually writing out, looking up that wind mask attribute and writing it in so that we can use it as a mask on our force attribute, the wind force attribute and stuff like that. And if we play that back, you can see that that really just sort of causes those two halves to um, pin together. Let me just get that template flag out of there. You can kind of see, you can actually see it with the mask and actually you can see it pulling those parts together like so. Right. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. I think you might be able to actually see the constraints if I do this too. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't I didn't save the constraints, so it's gonna try and actually sim them, but yeah, you can kind of catch a glimpse of those stitches, which are invisible, but they are contracting as that mask right. moves across. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So that's sort of, I mean, and that's the, like, that's pretty basic, but it's just so cool how Vellum is. Vellum is just so powerful. You can just send these mask attributes into those constraints and cause them to do their thing. And right. And that's it. You know, you got this part of the sim done. Now all I have to do is just like leave some tails on it, you know, so that it has enough room to go into the next thing. And that's it. it, it right. It's really fast. It's super fast sim, relatively speaking. And, yeah, no, at that's awesome. Point, that's really cool looking. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, at one point we were going to do like a bull, like a kind of, I don't know what it is, like a matador. What do they have when they kind of pull this thing out of the way? So at one point we were going to oh, edit yeah. it together with um, this kind of a sim. I don't know where, let's see, when does it start? 
Oh yeah. So I pre-roll it a little bit and then we pull it. So we were going to stitch these two together. So it was going to stitch together and then we were going to actually have it kind of pull off camera. I don't know if I have my camera set up here in a way that would work for that, but yeah, this might kind of show that you just have it kind of re reveal like that. Yeah. And then we would get into live action with that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And but then that we, would wipe on the next camera. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But we switched gears and went with the tearing mode as well instead. Mm -hmm. So the tearing mode is actually, I think what we do is I, I basically just grabbed this and copied it and pasted it over here and started making another vellum sim here, except the only difference is that on this one, in the lower left-hand corner, I just create a little group using a um, sphere. And then we just pull that down. So you can see that this animation is just, we don't really <laughs> need to see the, the, the mask doesn't really matter at this point, but yeah, it's just right. those points being pulled down like that. It looks super <laughs> yeah. crude, but, but no, it looks you know, it's funny. Yeah. And in on the stitch, you know, you just throw in a, a little bit of breaking here. It took a while mm -hmm. to actually find the, the, I think most of the fine tuning with this one, came from dialing this breaking threshold, which on this one, it's two to the minus five. So which is an extremely low value. But yeah. um, sometimes it's weird. It's like, sometimes I'm like, is break, is it working? Like, is it, and I'll just keep dialing it down. And eventually I'll cross a power of 10 where I'm like, okay, that worked. Now I just have to like find the area between the previous power of 10 and this power of 10 where <laughs> the peeling feels just right, you know? <laughs> yeah, sometimes the uh, the values can be really extreme um with vellum yeah <laughs> you, you see that from time to time yeah they they're, they get nuts um but that led to this sim so you kind of get this sort mm -hmm. of tug down there and it ripping apart and that you know even though the, that animation in that corner looked really dumb we're never going to see it and right. uh, one of my one of my lights just went out but <laughs> <laughs> we're having all sorts of technical issues tonight man yeah I'm just gonna. No, I'm gonna have nice dramatic over here. Yeah, you look that. super. You look moody now. I like it. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even notice it until you said it. So. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. Like threw me through a loop. I was just like, oh yeah. I guess I should plug that thing in. It's like a light that has battery or can be plugged in at the same time. But... <laughs> okay. So you ran out of battery. I did. So so you did the same trick here, right? Where you took that the state of that sim and then brought it over into this side, right? Into this kind of other um channel yeah. right yeah exactly so the, right here instead of using a switch this time i'm just using a blend shape so if i kind of if i show the previous sim these are both happening at frame zero so they're both i got it these both happen this stitching sim happens between frame you know one and you know let's say 150 and this one happens also between frame one and you know 100 or maybe 90 something like that yep Mm -hmm. Yeah, frame one in 120. And so what I did was just um, I time shifted this to the period of time where I wanted it to come in. So you can see I've just kind of pushed that back by 120 frames. So okay. at 120 frames, we're going to now tack this one onto the end of the initial one where it kind of wraps them together. And so right, right here, this blend shape just happens to kick off right at the beginning of that other one. And you can kind of see that it just transitions into that tug yeah oh that's so okay so yeah so i was actually wrong i was thinking that you were doing the same handoff that you were doing before but you're not you're because because you've kept the exact same geometry between the two simulations you're able to just blend between them in a blend shape which is again a very smart way to do this there's a little there's a little bit there where it's kind of like transitioning and then you're into the next sim yeah and and i think that I do do some setups where it is really taking the output of one vellum sim and going into another, but in the case where I, I feel like in this case, because of all the things that needed to happen with the constraints and having all that be pretty specific over here, it, mm -hmm. it helps to just not have it know about this mask attribute, not have it know, like yep. it's almost a way of cleaning it out. You know what I'm saying? Like, sure. We're just gonna, yeah. Yeah kind of copy it and it's just do its own thing and we can just offset it later. Right. Because you're not, you're not feeding in attributes that could, that could, um, 
you know, kind of interject into what you're doing in one sim or in a solver or whatever. It's just basically saying, yep, these are the same two exact streams of geometry. They match, you know, from a topology standpoint, but they're going to do some different things and we're going to just take those animations together. So yeah, that makes yeah, sense. It's, it's almost like a video editing, but with like 3d using time shifts and blend. Shifts. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, it really, it really is. Yeah, no, that's cool. It's kind of, you know, and they do this similar concept with like animation clips. I think like a lot of DCCs have that where mm -hmm. you can grab a bunch of MoGraph clip or uh, Mo, uh, MoCap kit clips and drop them into what looks like a timeline editor. I think C4D and Maya have similar ones. And I think that Houdini does have a motion clip thing too, where you, it's kind of like editing. There'll be like a crossfade, um, frames will be cross fading between different kin effects animations and stuff like yes that. for kin effects yep yep kin yeah. effects yeah kin effects rigs um basically they you can take the animation of a rig and um basically take time out as a variable and turn it into a motion clip so it takes every frame and makes a piece of geometry out of it and, and basically you know decouples the time element and then you can kind of mess with it and do all sorts of stuff but yeah you're right the motion clips is is um is it, it's sort of that it's definitely a very um rudimentary way of doing it it's i think it's a very clever way of doing it but it certainly is not as elegant as like timelines with you know bars and fading and all that kind of stuff but yeah like blocks and stuff yeah, yeah. exactly like a, a a better there there need you know i think there really could be an improvement there with a better ui but who knows <laughs> Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe someday in the future. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> As I if we don't of, have enough I, things going on, right? <laughs> I know. Like, I, I mean, it's, it is though, like, I'd have to say that I think that some of the most recent, it's crazy. Kin effects and Vellum and uh, Karma are just, it, it's like a completely different program than what it was three years ago. It's absolutely crazy how, <laughs> different Houdini is from when I started using it, you know? Right. No, I, yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Just in a few, in a few releases, <laughs> uh, nine hole says timeline mixer is an ancient feature request. <laughs> <laughs> it was chiseled in stone and handed to, uh, to the devs. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Anyways. All right. So, uh, back to your, back to your setup here. What do we, what do we got going on over there? Um, I, yeah, I think that this section is, is just the hairs. So the little part, the fibers that kind of rip. In oh, between. cool. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks like, yeah, somewhere here I'm getting this, um, geo that I've created that makes it, that actually kind of looks like this, this you know, stitches, you know, that stitches, goes in and yeah. um, and I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. What I, yeah, I just. I created that and then, you know, did my ways of making it kind of bump like that. But mm -hmm. then over here, it's a matter of, so this, this is where it got tricky. You can see, I've got these obnoxious lines. that just kind of go off and to, <laughs> off to wherever I didn't off clean this infinity. up. I, yeah, I do. I do things like this. Like there's a poly cut that comes up and then goes up here across this thing. This drives me nuts. Like if I was going to, if I, if, if I was going to give this project file to somebody else, I would definitely uh, clean this up, but it's just sort of the way it goes. But <laughs> this, <laughs> no, this basically, it. It, this is taking the output of that, those um, Sims. And if I'm not mistaken, it's just like a prim UV. So this is like causing it to um, move along with those uh, Sims that we were doing, although I'm not seeing it actually do anything because uh, let's just go down the line and see where things start happening. Cause now I'm getting a little bit confused. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no problem. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I separate it. So I just take like, these are the two halves. I'm creating an A group and a B group. So I don't know if that's mm -hmm. really visible, but there's an A group and yeah. a B group. So the yeah, bottom and the top half. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then maybe it's, this is where it's happening. There's a point to form. Yeah, so this point to form kind of takes those two halves and moves them along with the two separate pieces. And this is one of the I, I only like discovered this probably in the last year, but this piece attribute on the point to form is huge. So if we yep. look at the um if we look at the geo and we check out the class attribute, 
you can see that we've got two different pieces of geo and you can actually, because I've got these, uh, I think that at some point I named the halves of my geo uh, based off of that uh, class attribute. I'm not sure where I did it. I would have thought it would have been right here, but if I get in real close, you can see that I have that same kind of color scheme happening over here on my two halves of this geo. It's really tight though. So yeah, you can kind of see it's pink and purple. I kind of <laughs> grabbed that it's pink and off pink. <laughs> yeah. The, the random seed for uh, the color is it's kind of funny. I can't seem to change the seed either, but well, it's all right. It's, Don't worry. I'll take your word for two, it. I believe yeah, you. <laughs> there are two halves there, and they correspond to the two class attributes on the incoming geo from the clock. Right. And they allow you to point to form each side separately. So in the middle, we get this gigantic prim, you know, right here. Yeah. But uh, more or less, it's taking the one half, the, the half that's up here and pulling it with that cloth. So we kind of get that, you know, tearing motion set up for us that way. And then here, uh, Throw it in hair node, and I have a mask attribute. I'm not entirely sure what the mask attribute is doing. This mask attribute might help be helping handle the actual tearing of it. I'm not a hundred percent sure because this is pulling out of there. Yeah, this is pulling constraints out of there. I think that. Yeah, I. I I can't remember what I did here, but anyway, <laughs> something happens, <laughs> something happens here. And then we get the, uh, the tearing that goes on right here. So it's just sort of those hairs just getting stretched out right. and ripped across. And some of them kind of stretch out a little bit. And I think I do a little bit of kind of removing maybe some of the longer pieces. Yeah. Some I'm clean not up. sure. Yeah, right here you can see this nice blast note I think is doing some of that. Or actually, no, this is okay. So down here, what we're doing, there's again matching retime. So if we look at this retime is matching our like master retiming we're doing for everything. So there is a lot of this kind of stuff going on where you're, you know, referencing other retimes in the setup to make sure that you know, this SIM is actually timed up with the other SIM and it can result in some kind of nasty stacking of like time shifts and retime nodes like this. But that can be, that's probably the hardest part about doing a setup like this where you have different, you know, things that are out of time kind of working with one another is they, you run into situations where you have to do some sort of mental gymnastics with the time shifts. But yeah. um, this down here actually gets combined with the stitching, the stitching setup. So, if we look over here, there's a similar um, type of setup where I built this curve um, that's, you know, being point deformed along with the uh, setup of the initial part where it's coming together. You can see those mm -hmm. yep. two halves kind of coming together like that. And this is actually, uh, well, I'll add some like, um, I'll add like, you know, mask attributes. So there's a fall off from one side to the other. And then in the middle, I'll add like I'll add noise to everything, but then use that mask attribute to kind of fall off. So we've got this sort of noisy looking, these noisy looking fibers. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Going like that. So it kind of feels loose, you know, a little bit and then mm -hmm. it's like kind of tightening up. And so when we kind of blend that, this super noisy version with the fall off that we have from the edge, I think that's what this is, what, what we've got. Um, that's our noise. This is our mask for our fabric. So if we pull up the fabric mask, you can kind of see that this is just sort of the distance it is away from the edge. And you can use that as a mask to control how much of this noise is actually showing up. Right. And so this is a wrangle I use all the time. It's basically just look up whatever the position is in the second one, make a ramp out of that attribute and then blend between the two. So it's a blend shape. And really, you can kind of do this with blend shape now. I think blend the blend shape node has a mask attribute on it now, which is great. So you could do something similar where you're blending between this and whatever the second input is, which is this. So first input, second input. But now they added this, this mask blending. You can set from attribute yeah. here and then choose that mask. Um, what was it? it was mask... that mask fabric attribute. I don't see it in here. Mask fabric, maybe from the first input. 
I'm going to just type it in and see if it happens. <laughs> Oops, I got all caps there. Let's see. So, yeah, you can see that that's happening here. It's just inverted. So yeah, at some inverted. point along yeah, the yeah. way, you'd want to do the opposite of that, <laughs> you know? Right, right. Oh, that's cool. Uh, maybe no, an that's... attribute remap or something. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to just to flip it over. Yeah. No, that's really cool, and though. That's an interesting. I didn't know that that was a part of that either. So that's cool. Yeah, it's awesome that they added it to blend shape because if you have your map already good to go, then you're you're good. In this case, I you can see I'm just kind of controlling that using this mm -hmm. ramp right here. So I just kind of have a little ramp built in there. But this is one of those things that I save as a preset in my list of like presets down here. I just have my <laughs> MF, my LERP. I just use that all the time. You don't have but, any. You don't have any presets, do you? That you've made? No, I got. <laughs> no, not I got so many presets. <laughs> I save all these to the gallery because it's just like, it's like another thing. It's like HDAs. I like HDAs and I do make HDAs, but there's a time and a place. And sometimes yeah. the things that you do in a wrangle, you need to modify them. And yeah. it's just as easier to have them cracked open and ready to go. You know, no, hundred percent. Yeah. If you had to get inside of a, inside of an HDA and unlock it and do all that stuff just to like change, like a line of code or something that would be, yeah, yeah that would be such a pain. Um, and and so, oftentimes I don't. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh sorry. Um, I was just gonna say that um, uh, Lucas was asking something uh, about. He was saying, why not take the constraints that you made to connect the two cloths and isolate them into their own sim? So basically, yeah. I think I'm. I think he's saying instead of instead of the adding the stitching thing in, I think he's saying why not use that. Um, to connect the, the two cloths, I think for the, for like the tearing and stuff. Yeah. So I don't know. I think, I don't know what I, the geo that, that would be created by something like the stitch node to me, I it's doing a little bit. So for example, right here, like you can see it's, it's not actually like connecting in a straight line or in a coherent yeah. way where I can actually have it represented as one continuous line that runs from one side to the other. It's just sort of grabbing the nearest point on the other side of the cloth and just attaching to it. Yeah. And so using it as a force to interact with the vellum, it's exactly where it needs to be. But in terms of converting that itself into geo doesn't work. Um, yeah, visually, it's, it's not going to be yeah. as nice visually. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, that makes sense. No, I think that's I think that's a a pretty logical answer. Um, and yeah, when you see it that clearly, it's like, oh yeah, that's that's some kind of wacky geometry. Yeah, it's and I I sadly I don't have an example of it out uh, where it's stretched until I go into vellum, but um, no, that's it, cool. It is it is one of those things where it was it just made more sense because. You know, in the end, um, we did have this, like, you could see, like, the result of it actually forming um, along like this. Yeah, you yeah. You can actually see it really kind of doing that. Um, so that is kind of, I kind of did want to have that geo there. And then, really, it's just a matter of once once you get this all kind of lined up, you know, where it's doing this kind of masked um, sort of transition along with, the rest of the geo. I have this node, this super carve node that I made that does various things. But <laughs> one of the things that it can do is it actually will carve. This is an HDA. See, I, I actually still you make HDAs. You did it. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing that this one does is instead of like a carve, so like a carve will actually like delete points. And this mm -hmm. actually maintains topology. So you can see I've got like a couple methods here, but if I turn on my point, uh, my point numbers. Yep. Um, and let's see if we can find the end of this. It's kind okay, of hard because it moves really. Yeah, I just saw it jump by there real quick. Oh, where did it go? Okay, I see the end right here. So, yep. oh, th this is smart. I like I like this a lot. So this is the end, and if I show point numbers, all of the points that aren't fully, you know, all the rest of the points in this whole entire thread are all packed into this one little thing. You can see that there's a bunch of numbers overlapping here. So you can see that all of those points are just 
sitting there. If I um, if I go into maybe if I go into selection mode, now I lost it. If I go into selection mode and grab points, I wonder if it'll show in my geometry spreadsheet that I have like you know thousands of points selected. I may or may not be able to see that. No, it's not showing up. But at any rate, like if you take my word yeah. for it, I have just a tons of points just stacked on top of each other. So there's different methods that this super carve can do. It can do a distributed move where it's actually just spacing all those points out and moving them along uh, the, the curve. So if you have to watch this, it's actually kind of stretching it out and distributing those points along as it moves. And now something like that wouldn't work because it's going to, um, if I turn these point um, markers off, actually I'll go back to it. You can see that my noise pattern is all off and everything's all weird here because yeah, it's just wonky, like, yeah. it's it's prim UVing this basically along it. And mm -hmm. But if you do clustered tips, you get the benefits of having all your masks remain where they're supposed to remain, but also have a moving consistent topology on that point so you can actually add motion blur to it. So the whole point of this is so that this front leading edge, I mean, it's a crazy amount of motion blur. It's almost like hard to see, but you can see that that front edge, whoops, I'm, I'm grabbing the wrong timeline to, <laughs> I'm grabbing the Houdini timeline to move the DJ view timeline. <laughs> But you can see that it's it's still got some motion yeah. blur in there um, with that clustered tip. So that's the whole point of that. Yeah, um, and there's no, a bunch of other stuff that this. Lucas Lucas is asking how how that's built. Um, I'm guessing that's a little secret sauce. I'm not sure if that's if that's like a. Uh, no, just I mean mostly it's, code. It's, <laughs> it's yeah, it's overcomplicated. <laughs> yeah, it's it's overcomplicated. Just min and maxing stuff and like trying to find the minimum and maximum uh values of what right so the thing the thing that this thing can do and let me just you know let's just do a little old side thing because I, I don't know how much longer we have how much time you, do we have i don't know whatever okay cool when, uh, when i go to when i go to bed yeah <laughs> <laughs> nice i i'll uh throw down a a line and kind of show you what some of the sure. things that this can do because it's it's a cool one um let's just copy this copy and transform like a hundred of them off to the side or something. So this is like one of the things that I like to use with like weaves or kind of things like motion graphics. -y things is the super carve. So super carve. And um, it works like a normal carve. We just enable like U one and you're carving like that. And this okay. is doing that dis distributed move method. So let's actually add some more line, uh, more points in here so you can kind of see. Um, uh, let's see. Guides. What is it? The point marker size? Yeah, let's make yeah, those yeah, bigger. Yeah, that's it. So here, what I was showing this before is this is, you know, a distributed move. It's actually, it's actually scaling, really just kind of scaling those points as they're distributed along. But the... Um, it's going to actually remove, let's go down to 50. And let's give this a little bit more space. Just make it a little bit easier to see. Sure, um, sure. So the distributed move is actually like kind of, you know, stretching those points along the curve. The classic carve is doing what the other carve does, which is the point just comes along and deletes the points below it. So if you look yeah, at Yeah, and it kind of scales at the tip, right? Because it's almost like it's, because it's cutting it, but in between. So it's like, there's like another point that kind of slides along and then they all, yeah, they all switch. Yeah. yeah and then it just deletes it, yep. but the clustered tip will actually kind of keep them all, you know, bunched together. You can see that it's actually just leaving points behind as it goes. Yeah. It's like and dropping then, them off. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's sort of where it can come in handy, depending on what you're trying to do with motion blur. If you just want the tip to like have motion blur, that works. If you need the whole thing to have motion blur, cause it's flowing along in a certain way, you can do that distributed move. And so those are sort of where those things come in handy. But the other thing that this thing can do, I'm just going to turn off point modes is I've got a uh, randomness in there so we can offset each one of them. I'm going to offset you. So now if I have like a keyframe in here, sure, right, I'll, I'll keyframe at one and then we'll go up to frame 60 and keyframe this to one. So I can just keep, um, sliding this you can kind of see that that 
that this we sort of get this offsetting and we can like absolutely go extreme with it and crank that offset all the way up to one and we can fire these off one by one so we can have them all like kind of carve on one by one and really what is going on here is it's a lot of just like realizing what the like largest amount it, it's a lot of normalization basically it's super confusing and i honestly forget how it works almost every <laughs> single time. I honestly don't even understand what's going on inside of this node anymore because it was it, I made it so long ago and I have better ways of doing it now. But I just it's one of those things like I had it and I built it at one point and it still works. So right. I can also add randomness to it. So you can kind of like have this pass through and and really the goal is like it's a slider that goes from zero to one it complete it goes from completely off to completely on and no matter what you throw at it so an extreme amount of randomization extreme amount of offsetting this will you know handle all of that for you um so you that's could have them all go at once randomly or whatever yeah no no that makes yeah that's i see what you're saying you're basically normalizing all of these values and like making sure that that one slider can control everything basically without without breaking uh your whole setup basically that's exactly that's cool that's really nice and that's then these nice. these little things down here have a little bit of uh extra so these these do extra interpolation for you so you can actually have it do like easing for you and stuff yeah. like that oh that's nice um it's so like, that's yeah this is like a very mo graphy kind of tool i feel like it's 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 slick i like that yeah it's a handy one I, I was planning on like hopefully making a tutorial about how to do this someday but i i have plans for tutorials that i just like i can't it's so hard <laughs> to juggle everything sure I, like, sure i love sharing and teaching but man i just some i gotta manage like my uh time still so <laughs> your your life you you have to have yeah. some sort of life yeah no fair <laughs> yeah fair um, so yeah, that was a little side into the super. No, no, I love it. I love it. Thank we you for got showing there. That. Yeah, for sure. Um, we got there. We went over here because ultimately <laughs> this one gets combined with the other one. And at some point we do a switch between them. So if we look at this big stitching thing that's happening in the sim here, mm -hmm. um, it's crawling across, it gets, slammed together and then it gets torn apart so this i i more or less had to kind of stitch those two um parts together just like i did before but now just with this hand animated version of that stitching that we just were looking at and mm -hmm. this simmed version that's over here if that makes any sense okay yeah because you're using the same you're using the same uh geometry for both of those so you're just switching it in that case yep cool yeah nice that's really cool yeah i like that a lot but, but yeah it's like a lot of managing um a lot of managing time shifts and you know the positions of what uh, um and like prim uving things to like line up with other sims and stuff so that part can be a little bit like uh what did i get myself into but just <laughs> you gotta take a break go grab a cup of coffee come back take a breather and then just sit there and figure it out and it's all good <laughs> it works yeah. out it works out in the end I think many times that's that's always the best uh, advice when you're in a big project is like give yourself a few minutes, go get a go take a breather, and I feel like nine times out of ten you're gonna come back and you're gonna be, you're gonna have some aha moment and be able to tackle something that you thought you were just bashing your head against the table for you know however many hours before. Yeah, I I can like get into these like tunnels where I'm just like sitting there and I'm like. I'm just struggling and like, yeah. I feel that my stress on trying to figure it out will actually like get me like in my own way. And I, I yeah. get all like frazzled and, and stuff. And then, no, I think that's, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Cause like sometimes you get so tunnel vision on, on one solution that you think is like, this is the way I've got to do it. And sometimes just stepping away and letting your brain just kind of unconsciously kind of roll in the background on something while you're doing, you know, making a sandwich or something can, can, unlock a, a different thought process so now it makes total sense for sure yeah so um i don't know i mean do you uh do you want to do one more should we do one more yeah let's let's do one more yeah we got a little we got a little bit more time i i'm i usually go a little longer so that's that's totally fine uh yeah let's do let's do one more what do you got for us cool um 
Well, is it first, is it cool if I take a quick break and then come back? Yeah, of course, man. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. Um, yeah, let me uh, let me just get you off here for a second, and you can you can do what you need to. Yeah, take take your take your time, man. <clears throat> yeah, no problem at all. No problem at all. Yeah. So um, so while Mark is taking a quick break here, um, um, yeah. So coming up, like uh, in the next few weeks, um, I'm thinking about talking a little bit more about some vellum um sims and things like that maybe starting from from a little bit of a more basic um standpoint as far as um you know what what specifically some of the ideas of vellum are how they work um and uh you know just just making uh kind of getting some of the ideas of what point attributes you want to have on things and you know constraint attributes and how those all kind of work together um because sometimes we look at um <clears throat> especially something like like vellum as i don't know sort of a a thing where you have all these these nodes that are the only way of being able to do x y or z but really what those nodes are doing is creating um you know attributes or adding lines and things like that they're a really well defined tool set but sometimes knowing what's going on in there can be um can be really helpful. So um, I'm thinking of kind of starting from a from a really basic standpoint and kind of working through, um, you know, vellum and, and and working with some of those things. So um, hopefully that'll be um, a nice little series to kind of start up in the in the coming weeks here. Um, the other thing too, um, as I see Mark is is coming back. Um, Mark, I know that you. Um, Yes. Oh, question in the chat. Yes. Am I looking into mops? Yes, I am. Um, kind of both of those in, in simultaneous, um, you know, I've been going through those both, but, um, yeah, I, like I said, I was away a little bit, so I haven't had a ton of time to put into that, but I'm hoping this week, um, I'll be able to, uh, take a little bit more time and really, uh, kind of crank on both of those. Um, but yeah, Mark, you actually had something we were talking about, I think it was yesterday or something about, some tutorials that you were thinking of putting out um, on your Patreon, I think, or um, maybe about the stitching or something. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I just wanted to give you a chance to kind of plug that if you were, uh, if you wanted to, or your Patreon or whatever you would like to plug. Oh, sorry. I muted you. My bad. Oh, all good. There you, you go. Hear me now? Yeah, I got you. I got you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, about that. I don't. I don't actually have a Patreon, but um, oh, okay. I just kind of do my YouTube channel. I do have courses with uh, Houdini School and MoGraph.com with the stuff. Oh, okay. Afraid of Houdini and stuff like that. Um, and goal is to like ultimately, I'm looking forward to trying to update that course. Um, maybe around the time Houdini 20 comes out. Um. And uh, in general, I just like putting stuff on YouTube for right now is good for me. Cool, Patreon, cool. I'm like a little nervous about Patreon because like I feel like if I do a Patreon, then I'm going to be like, I'm going to have to do lots of tutorials. And I'm kind of like a fits and starts kind of guy. Like I'll do a couple of tutorials for a couple of months and then I'll take a break. And yeah. I feel like I wouldn't be able to adhere to a normal <laughs> schedule that would be worth people paying me for it. So I just throw it on YouTube I, whenever I get a chance. I am totally in the same boat there i've i've thought about like should i do something like that i don't know and then i'm just like nah i it, i'd rather just do this stuff as I, as my life allows and just kind of leave it at that <laughs> so yeah, I, yeah totally I, feel like, I feel like it would eventually just be people being like uh yeah so i'm canceling my subscription because you don't do anything because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been how many weeks since you've put anything out and it's yeah it's i don't think i would want that uh hanging over my head i hear you but well that's cool yeah i mean um yeah definitely houdini school is is awesome and uh um you know that i know you have you have a course on there or a couple courses or yeah i did one with uh trees like so it's like using kin effects in the labs tree tools to like make growing animations and stuff like that oh cool yeah um that one was really fun to figure out and actually use that um set up in everything now <laughs> um, we did a we did this gigantic billboard for um, I don't know if you guys saw it, but it was this billboard with all these shoes. The shoes, I know yeah, Lucas yeah. Saw it. yeah, yeah. I definitely I know, saw it. 
Yeah, it was like a bunch of shoes that was on a billboard in Japan. And in the background of one of those shoes, I used the tree rig that I made for that course. So there's a tree that grows in this like Garden of Eden type of setting. Um, and so I was able to get that one in there. It's kind of cool. Oh, that's awesome. Very cool. Nice. But yeah, I love I love doing that kind of stuff. So um, but yeah, other than that, I I have tutorials, like I've got a whole list of tutorials that I'm hoping to make someday. And someday I want to make a knitting tutorial, but I just, it's so complicated. So I have like a hard time. Like I find my tutorials are either like very basic or extremely complicated. <laughs> I like to try and find the middle ground. Like the tree tutorial started off very basic, but then I rabbit hold myself into making it the most complicated thing ever. So chapter three of the tree tutorial is just like, oh God, <laughs> it's just crazy. <laughs> Building a wind system with chops. It was, it was nuts. With chops. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it was kind of similar to like what I was showing you with the noisy wind yeah. that I had before, like using gusts and chops to handle the how much the like how much the leaves themselves should flutter. Cool. And oh wow. It was it was it was dark. It got dark. <laughs> Well, I mean, I guess chops will do that sometimes. Sometimes you, you find you find another place that you really didn't want to end up in there. But <laughs> yeah, I was like, I guess this is it. I, I ended up trying to make my own salt. So I feel like that's the thing is like what you're supposed to do is make your own solver. And if you if you can you make your own solver to do it, and if that is not impossible to deal with, you roll with it. But then at a certain point depending on what you're trying to do, like making your own solver, it's just not visual. So I was in a place where I was actually graphing the results of my solver in the viewport using curves. And I'm like, okay. what are you doing? Just, <laughs> I was basically rebuilding chops in the viewport. And I was like, let's just go back to using chops. It's going to be fine. You know, <laughs> like, I don't know what the best practice is now. Like I love chops and I, I, I love chops, but I always feel like people are trying to encourage us to not use it. Does that ever kind of feel like, do you ever yeah. feel like people are trying to encourage you not to use chops? I don't know. Yeah, no. Uh, um, Ninehole just said thanks for the temporal smooth idea uh, way back versus uh, using chops. Um, yeah, see, I've been doing it. I've been doing it this whole time <laughs> with, the te with temporal smoothing and stuff. It's one of my favorite things to do, and I was using chops to do that forever. But I'm always like looking. Okay, well, we're going to use a solver instead. You know, so it's more scalable yeah. or whatever. I I just. I was just screwing around with something the other day and I, and I did that. I, I brought it into chops and I was like, I can just smooth this out in chops. Like that's the whole point is you, it, that's what it does. So why not? Yeah. It's, there's nothing it's, wrong with that. It's, no, it's, it's great. That's what it's there for. It seems like all of side effects forum dogs hate chops. That's what somebody, somebody's saying in the chat. Yeah. Oh, OGs, not dogs. I didn't know what dogs meant. OGs. I see. <laughs> It's a good typo. I was like, I don't know what a forum dog is, but I'm, I'm probably getting too old to know what that is. So <laughs> anyways, oh, funny. I'm going to hand, I'll hand this back over to you and we, we can actually do some more, uh, a little more walkthrough of, of this. What is this? Uh, what is this that we're going to see here? Okay. So I was going to look at, um, this one right here. So this is sort of another kind of an RBD one, but it's oh, using cool. RBD in a different way where we're kind of like rolling up this turf and like all the concrete and pieces are falling out. So this is using a guided RBD and just some layering. And I don't think that in this situation, it, there isn't like a lot going on in terms of like me doing a section and handing it off to another section and another. Um, this is just more or less using kin effects and using kin effects to guide an rbd sim so yes cool it was it was kind of a fun one but yeah and it was funny because like this project um we're like yeah we're gonna do it and we got this white psych idea from mid journey actually we weren't we didn't know what the environment was gonna look like but um my boss was kind of just jamming out some ideas and got a style board from mid journey that had this grass kind of like in a psych fall off type of a scenario. And mm -hmm. sort of we, this is one of the first examples of borrowing a concept from mid journey and using it in production, I guess for me at least. Yeah, sure. In history. No, no, just for me. <laughs> like, I don't, 
like I, 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 I know like other people have yeah yeah, yeah. No, I, it, it felt like a milestone it, it yeah. felt like a milestone because you're like okay i got a board that i got i got a board that came out of mid-journey i'm gonna be i'm not gonna be upset about it i'm just gonna be cool with it we're gonna roll with it and <laughs> it was great you know yeah. It it's, it's so easy to be intimidated by like, oh my God, client is sending me mid journey style boards, but yeah, <laughs> it okay. is a, it is a frightening proposition, but <laughs> it is. Oh. <laughs> anyways. So anyways, this setup I have over here and so you can see this is a, you know, there's a lot going on here, but um, most of it is just like layering one thing on top of another. I think the majority of what happens is with this guided RVD sim. So if I kind of just go up here, you can see that, what did I, I had, let's see if I go back. Yeah, I can hit the undo key and figure out where that's, what node is selected or can I? Yeah, here that's we right. go. Yeah, so here what I did was um, we made this, you know, big, you know, grid of, this area where we're going to actually, you know, rip this piece out of the ground. And I just kind of drew a curve through where that was going to be like this and um, through, through a rig doctor and then sent it through like my kind of masking setup and then a rig attribute wrangle. And this rig attribute wrangle does this kind of uh, rolling up. So really it's just a, a mask, a normalized mask that is going through like, so, so you can kind of see that um, mask attribute running through that curve there, and then it gets sent into the rig attribute wrangle, and that handles the rolling up of it. And then, so over here, we actually extrude the ground and do an RBD material fracture on it. And so you'll see that, um, if give that a second to cook, we get all that extra, um, we get all these extra pieces in here. Hey, uh, real quick, can you explain why you put that through the rig doctor? Uh, just so that, you know, we kind of understand that. I, if, for people that don't that don't know why you put the the line through that. Oh yeah, so rig doctor will just um, help you kind of set up the attributes that you need to be working with KinFX. The rig doctor, I'm not actually using it as like a doctor to like fix anything. I'm actually using it to initialize these transforms and reorn reorienting to child. So if I um, turn on this display you can kind of actually let me just grab this transform and visualize that if i get in real close here you can see that it's actually creating these transforms so it's a transform on which controls like you know the direction that the bone or the joint is facing in and it points along the curve like that yep. so it's all axis aligned and everything and that's really what rig doctor is doing is it's giving us all that and i think that it might also be giving us names so if I pop this out here, I'm gonna just throw down the um, the oh rig yeah tree. the rig tree yeah yeah yep. There so if I if I barrel down this, I think I saw um, <laughs> this is just one parented to the next, so I can just keep opening these and it's gonna go all the way for however many points this is, but it's not a very interesting tree. It just keeps going and going. <laughs> yeah, though. No. I saw Jeff Wagner using this and I was like, oh, this is a great thing to have because you can just go select, you know, a point in your tree yeah. and kind of and reparent it. Yeah. And like navigate this like you would a normal DCC, so to say, so to speak, like, you know, it's a hierarchy yeah. like you would see in cinema or something like that. Right, um, right, right, right. Yeah. No, it's good. Maya. I just I, I, you know, I just wanted to make sure people knew like that you can just basically take a because you're just. It's a rig is just lines and points, right? So, I mean, you throw that into the rig doctor, initialize those transform that gives you the names and all that stuff. And then you're kind of off able to start going into, uh, you know, kin effects. So, yeah. And, you know, I, one of the other notes that I was using was the uh, skeleton. Yep. You can get like a similar result by piping this into a skeleton. But the problem here is that at least, and I don't know if that's the way that this works now, but you'd have to stash your input in, and it wouldn't really bake upstream. So if mm -hmm. I made changes up yeah. here, it was I would have to restash it. And the rig doctor kind of stays live all the time. So as long as it's not too complicated, depending on what you're trying to do, I just like the rig doctor because it stays live. You know? Yeah, I no agree. I think I think the skeleton is a little more um, made for something that's not going to be changing upstream. You know, like like a like the structure for a character or something like that. So yeah, yeah. it makes sense to use the rig doctor for sure. 
Um, but and they both do example, similar things. Yeah, this one is such a short network. I could have just as well used the skeleton, but I don't know. I mean, no, no, it it's makes, just no, less, I, less to think about for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it makes sense. It makes sense. Cool. Okay, so that cooked. So we got our fracture here. Yeah, so we got the fracture. I'm going to get this rig tree out of here. Let's just close this up. I don't know. Get that out of the way. Okay. Um, and <laughs> it's always fun. Let's look at names so we can see all the different pieces here. And then um, I'm just capturing. So this is packed. So I'm packing this up using an assemble. And um, my name visualization goes away. But when, when it's packed, it actually is going, you know, these are all turned into, you know, packed primitives there. Uh, they got primitive intrinsic. So we're, you know, when you kind of capture this geometry and move it, they all kind of move as one piece as opposed to um, a bunch of different um, points in space being deformed. So when we go and do this bone deform, we actually have it kind of rolling up those pieces, but they're maintaining their shape. If I didn't pack this, it might look a lot smoother. You can see that yeah. it's kind of all weird like that. It doesn't know that like it, you know, these pieces are connected to this wall. It's they're not within the capture region. So actually packing up this geo before deforming it really gets it to kind of like act like these, these are still solid chunks. They're rotating the way they should, but they're still like their own thing. They're not getting skewed and stretched all over the place. So that's a cool thing that you can actually use Kinefix to, um, you know, animate packed geometry because you could get some really cool animations. Like if you wanted to clone a bunch of cubes on this, you could actually like, you know, you know, bend the cubes around, but the cubes would actually stay as cubes and not get skewed or distorted, which is really right. what kind of we're after, you know? Um, and so this kind of rolls up. You can see that this front end, this front edge, because of the way the capture is working, it's just reaching out and grabbing all those points. And I think all of them are probably parented to like the same joint. That's why we get this big flat area here, but it's a guided sim. So we just let RBD take care of the rest for us. So this gets all weird towards the end of it rolling up. But at the end of the day, this is going into the guided section of the RBD bullet solver. So we, um, I'm just like unpacking that geo now. And um, I think I'm copying back yeah, the active group to it. So there's just a group in the middle that is active. And we put that into this RBD bullet solver. And I don't really want it to sim. I have a cache of it, but we'll kind of, I'm going to go back to frame zero and just kind of look at um, here on the RBD bullet solver. Um, under the guide, I'm bringing in the guide and you can set all these different um release thresholds for like when it's supposed to, you know, like what angular threshold it's supposed to be at before it starts to break off from the original SIM and stuff like that. And there's also under this advanced tab, um, if you untick use pre-configured setup, there's a bunch of other um, settings here you can use to control like how far it moves from its original position before it starts to be like, you know, let, like let go of and, you know, added to the sim so it's sort of like being influenced but also trying to sim at the same time and it's it's interesting because it's almost like a kind of a middle ground between what we were doing before where we were actually modifying that active and animated attribute it's sort of like halfway between those attributes and something a little bit mushier i don't really know how to describe it but it <laughs> allows you to kind of get those um uh, those pieces to uh, be guided along by that animation. You can see here, I'm actually caching the points on this one and doing the point transform. So, or the transform pieces. So if we go down here and let that load up. And just, it's doing, uh, just so I am remembering here that that guided is the, what is that? Fifth input on the, on the RBD bullet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. It's that last input. Yep. There after the collision. So here, I'm not exactly sure how well this is going to scrub, but you can see that as it's starting to curl up, it's really, some pieces are falling off. Some of them are staying in that front edge that was causing a problem before in kin effects now is being dealt with. It's running into an issue there and just kind of like rolling in on itself. So if we go back here. You can see that we're not getting that same issue where that front edge was sticking out all straight. It's just all getting bunched up right. and breaking apart like so. It's a really cool feature in um, 
in the RBD bullet solver. It's great. Yeah, that's yeah, that's you would think that that would cause a lot of problems with that like weird flat thing, but it's just kind of releasing them as it starts to collide like that, right? So it's it's starting to like let them go. Yeah, or or even like yeah, some of them get left go, let go, but some of them also still like maintain like rolling in. I just don't even know because if we compare this to what we have over here. I'm not even seeing. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, the, the bone, bone to form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like at this point in the animation, like this is way up here. And <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's... Yeah. It's just it, it's managing it. You know, it's it's doing it's doing the right thing. I Yeah. It looks like all those front pieces have broken off at this point. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool, though. No, it's like really nice that like it it it, it tries to keep as much as possible within those parameters that you set kind of staying within that that nice tight curl that you've got set up but like anything that that you know is impossible in this setup it, it's it's figuring out a way to deal with those it's nice it's a nice yeah uh, yeah and it's it's a really cool thing that they added i am not 100 percent sure how i would set this up on my own and thankfully that it's built into the rbd bullet solver now. right <laughs> i don't have to yeah, exactly. <laughs> so really, that's sort of like the bottom layer. This is sort of the driver for everything else that happens in the sim. So this is like another example of that one-way interaction. Like I'm not looking for any other aspects of this sim to have any influence on what these main concrete blocks are doing. They're 10 times heavier than anything else in the sim, and they can drive it, you know? So that's yep. sort of kind of like managing that dependency thing. You know, if we look here... We've got like a top layer that breaks off. We've got this under layer. We've got a bunch of grains that are being emitted into the sim with like, you know, um, grains with some of them have instances on them. Some of them don't. And from the side view, you can kind of see that we've got grass instanced on top of the dirt. And the dirt is just using another RBD sim that is, um, but it's using soft constraints. So that's really sort of the next layer that goes on top of the concrete. So if we go over here, it's basically taking the same geo that we started with and we're just grabbing a little section out of it and extruding it and doing a Voronoi on this one um, because this is going to be covered in grass. And I, I just went with good old Voronoi with it because we're going to cover <laughs> yep. it with grass and just add displacement. And we're never really going to see the, you know, the voronoi of it <laughs> for lack of a better term. <laughs> the Voronicity? The vor yes, the vornicity. <laughs> um, that's got to be. That. That's got to be the correct the correct word. I it has to be. It it does. I, it sounds good to me. <laughs> um, but then this RBD configure uh, in here. Let me see what I'm doing with this one. I I can't remember. It's not this one that I'm setting the. I might be setting like what the um. This might actually just be packing for me. Yeah, I think I might just actually be using this to pack. Okay, cool. So I'm using the RBD configure to pack the geos, but then on the RBD constraint properties, I'm using the soft constraint. And this soft constraint allows you to set properties that like allow it to allow the constraints to flex and bend a little bit and stretch a little bit. Um, but but um also sort of like and it also has like a, a breaking threshold, I think. So you can actually have a little bit of a little bit of like a soft body kind of vibe between your pieces, but your pieces themselves remain pretty um, much intact. So if we look at uh, what this sim looks like, let's pull up the cache here. This one, so this is actually the, so the result of we're using this as a collider underneath it. So this is just a lower res version of our um, previous fracture. This is coming in as our collision geometry. And then okay. it is being used to drive this. And you can kind of see, you can kind of get a feel for how this feels a little bit softer than normal RBDs. It kind of like has a little bit, and you see that kind of has a little bit of a, a nudge there. Where it kind of like pulls everything around it. This kind of like bumps up a little bit and just kind of like has a little bit more of an earthy feel than straight up RBDs. And then those keep going and we get this sort of like movement in the earth and it kind of all falls apart at the end. 
but it, yeah. it was kind of working to like, you know, cover it with grass and it kind of works, <laughs> you know? <laughs> But yeah, this kind of soft RBD constraint is nice for making kind of dirt chunks like that. Um, it's really jittery. So I'm sure at some point I did a smoothing operation. You can see that these guys are jumping around and I might've been able to solve that using some sort of damping inside of the sim. But um, a lot of times I will do like a temporal um, smoothing setup on them. Um, I'm not exactly sure where that was happening if I was doing it. Uh, it seemed smooth in the uh, render, so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, no one noticed. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of stuff happening can can hide all uh, a multitude of of uh, of sins, right? All the crimes, <laughs> all those crimes. <laughs> well, we won't tell. Yeah. if there's some jitters in there. Yeah, there might be. I think there might be, but um. Anyway, so that happens and yeah. then we go into making a grain sim out of these pieces so again it's like what we did before debris source um working on all of these pieces together so i'm just combining the two rbd sims together and using debris source on those and then down here i did a vellum constraint uh vellum grain constraints out of them and this is what i'll do a lot is i'll start with the vellum sim using vellum grains and then i'll switch to uh just the old school um pop grains and in this case pop grains one for me i felt i don't know what it is it's it just seemed I, i'm not exactly sure what makes me like a pop grain sim more than a vellum grain sim but just about any time i have to do a straight up grain sim i'm doing both of them and picking my favorite and so okay. that's sort that's sort of where i wound up here with uh with these points. If I turn off this, can we see them? Yeah. So this is just emitting um, more dirt into the scene like that. Right. Colliding with itself. And um, then again, down here, doing what I did before with the other setup, which is splitting off, saying, um, you know, a bunch of these are going to be actual chunks that we're going to instance rocks on. And then the, the rest are actually going to be left as particles that we're going to render out on the object. Right. Level. And that's the same, same exact thing you did before. Yeah. Just sort of yep. taking some, some parts of it and doing that with it. Um, and then I think that over here, over here, I think what I'm doing is just uh, creating grass. So uh, coming up with an area to uh, add our grass. And I think a lot of this is just sort of masking like these areas of grass. We just kind of wanted to have it kind of fade off into these different like kind of angles, not like a perfect circle, but just kind of have some edges to it. Um, so if I look at these, the distance along geometry, we should have some kind of masks for that in here. You can kind of see okay. that fall off built in there, but it also has these hard edges built into it. Um, and then uh, let's see. Here, what I'm doing is uh, just grabbing those, um, grabbing that top layer of RBD and see if I just grab these right here and time shifting it so that it's stuck at frame zero and then just scattering a bunch of points on it and then um, randomizing the orientation of those points so that once we put, um, you know, grass pieces on them, they'll be kind of pointing in all sorts of different uh, directions. And then what I did here was this is just updating the orientation of those pieces as they move along with the RBD sim. So you can see there's like a whole bunch of orientation uh, attributes, but <laughs> if you look really closely, these uh, Y axes are pointing in the direction of where that piece is facing. So that's right. just more or less ways, really over complicated ways of sticking the, uh, clones onto the ends of the uh, onto the rbd pieces and having them maintain the right orientation um and so if i kind of visualize that this may work <laughs> always uh, yeah. famous last words right <laughs> yes 
<laughs> it's hard to know whether it's like, I'm, am I going to crash my computer? It's funny because this computer that I have at home is nowhere near as powerful as it is at work. And so I'm always right. like, eh. the, the knitting setup, I crashed my computer yesterday going through the knitting setup. And I was like, I probably can't talk about this because my computer literally can't handle it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you can see that these little grass blades are all kind of pointed in the direction of the uh of the geometry and honestly what might have been easier is if i had and i i did this recently what i could have done here in this situation is actually um attribute transfer the name of the closest piece to the grass and then packed the grass or or um use the same transform pieces right here that we're using to update the original sim using this transform pieces on the named pieces of on these named points and it would have maintained the orientations the way i wanted to oh That's what right I, yeah this is a really roundabout way of doing it where i'm actually like looking up the rest in animated matrix and it's also not perfect because you can see some of these are like not normalized and they're pointing off in infinity and everything like that <laughs> but so it's you you're always learning <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're always learning new ways yeah. to do things. Well, and and and, we, in pr and when you're doing production stuff, right? It's sometimes it's just like, okay, this is in my brain right now, and I'm doing it, and it's done. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, and exactly. it worked. Yeah. And then you go back and, and so look at it, and you're the, like, huh, I'm not sure why why I did that. <laughs> yeah, and that's like exactly like what I'm doing right now. I'm just like, yeah, I could. It would have been way easier than trying to do all this prim UV stuff that didn't end up working out anyways. I mean, <laughs> when you're in the heat of the moment, you just go with it, you know? Yeah. You just go <laughs> probably a perfect example of when I had tunnel vision because you know, you're, I was working on this and I maybe didn't go get a cup of coffee and take a breather when I was supposed to. And that resulted <laughs> in this nonsense over here. I could have easily just like thought clearly about it and just copied to transform pieces down here, but whatever, yeah. you know, it there happens. <laughs> So yeah, um, I got the grass pieces and if we go back up here, I'm not sure if my viewport can, can handle it, but we'll just try and see if I can turn on all these things. <laughs> I got a good feeling about it though. All right. Famous Everybody good words. thoughts. Well, I'll, I'll think good thoughts. In my infinite psych, there we go. And oh wow, yeah. Right here, on this little <laughs> tiny thing. <laughs> that is that is definitely a big psych, yeah. You know, sometimes you just like you you get nervous and you're like, is it big enough? I don't know. I mean, I think I had to make it that big because one of my camera angles was um, what was right. Here. Oh my gosh, so you can see that's that. like. <laughs> it was like a wide angle. I'm like, I really got to make that psych pretty tall. So that's, that, was, <laughs> that seems so ridiculous, but it's totally needed. There it is. Proof. Yeah. Like right, right there. We wouldn't have, it would have been like <laughs> black up there if I. Wow. That, there you go. Yeah. You, some, you never know. You never know what you got to, what crazy shapes you got to make to, to hide something in the background. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, it's all working. Look at that. It looks like you got everything in the viewport. Yeah. It's got these little grass chunks on there. You can see the the grass blades i honestly would probably need to do so i i went back and forth between doing this actually with a vellum sim so at one point there was i was thinking about actually um, simming the grass doing yeah yeah like simming the grass but also simming the, like shape match and making this whole thing um all way feedback you know what i'm saying making it one right. giant sim and if I jump in here, I can see, I, I was looking at this yesterday and I can see where I started to go down that road um, over here. Like this was me starting to do that, like this whole section right here. And for one reason or another, I jumped ship and went back to doing it with an RBD like way. Mm -hmm. And it, it just, it ended up working out fine. <laughs> yeah. You know? It yeah, sometimes you one don't of those need things, to overcomplicate it. Yeah. It was. It was like I was really I had other other um people at the studio were getting good results doing stuff using the RBD method of m manipulating the grass. And I was like, 
you know, I, or, you know, manipulating that kind of like dirt destruction. And I was like, I'm just going to go with that. I, I, they, they've got it working. I, it, it's an opportunity to stay on the whole one way interaction street. Um, with mm -hmm. not like throwing all my eggs in one basket just because it's easier to iterate it's quicker to iterate and i just like to do it when i can so it's just sort of like another that's sort of the theme of the day is like i guess my thing is like modularizing and making it as compartmentalized as possible you know yeah kind of giving yourself checkpoints right like through this through the process so you can kind of say you know you can get this working then the next thing then the next thing and not try to have every single parameter be live and Im impacting each other, you know, in, in one SIM. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Cool. Well, well yeah, that's, that's awesome. all I got for projects, but I mean, I, I'm <laughs> so glad that, um, you had the patience to look at some of those things. Cause oh my gosh, I'm like, yeah. no, I love it. No, I, I don't think, Patience is the right word. I, I, I love getting to see other people's, um, you know, work in, in, you know, in Houdini or in general. Um, it's always fun to kind of see other people's like thought process. And that's, and, and honestly, that's the beauty of Houdini is you get to see the thought process, right? Like if you opened up yeah. any other program, it's like, well, I had to, you know, I had to, you know, flatten all these things down or whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, it's really cool to get to kind of walk through the thought process with you and see kind of, oh, yeah, I was thinking this over here and but this over there. And like, I think it's really it's always really helpful, I think, to, to see that um, someone uh, KG is asking, um, uh, what compositor did you use for the final? Um, we used After Effects for sure. We use After Effects if we did it at all. If we did any compositing, it was in After Effects, I think. Mostly though, what we did was a lot of times we just render it out and just bake in the, you know, we bake in the, um, beauty pass, like all the post effects in Redshift and all that stuff. So a lot of times we try to nail it in PNG files, you know, mm -hmm. just 16 bit yeah. PNG files. It seems so scrappy, but trust me, I mean, like at the end of the day, when you've got to ship the final version and we've already got it all working and you don't really necessarily want to like reroute a whole stack of AOVs through a bunch of pre comps and after effects. Yeah. Just if you can nail it, if we can nail it in the beauty, we, we do, it doesn't work every time, but I think for all these shots, it worked. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and just a comment here in the chat, he's talking about uh redshift strands. Um, seems like redshift doesn't care about the orient attribute but prefer, prefers the normal and maybe up uh, but also there's the screen space adaptive tessellation checkbox that defaults to on for strands which i think should be off by default so there's an interesting piece of information um that's fantastic if there is a way because i would love to get back to using the old school like the old sweeping method where it sweeps at render time and you tell it whether you want there to be a box or a circle mm -hmm. or, or, or what or a triangle that or a strip that sweeps along because i've been banging my head against the wall on that i never thought to think that it was using an and an up attribute instead of orient i'm like sitting there trying to bake orient attributes into and i'm like redshift doesn't care and i'm like i should have thought i should have thought to do that it's great that would be so would save me so much time and so much extra hard drive space if i didn't have to cash out these magnificent right. things with swept ge geometry on them <laughs> right you're adding like like three or four times the amount of geometry that needs yeah. to be there um Oh yeah, he's saying I don't think uh, Redshift likes Vector Four. That makes sense. Quaternions okay. are, you know, are the maybe some sort of weird black magic, anyways. So, thank uh, you, whoever you are. For that is Zach. That. that is Zach. Thank yeah. you so. Um, much. I'm gonna um, be trying that on Monday. Yeah, check it out in the in the chat, and uh, you can you can read that and just uh, um, take a look. So the other thing Lucas was asking was. Um, he was asking how you establish like your first uh, baselines when you have a style frame in front of you. Uh, when do you know you've broken it down far enough to start? I guess really like a lot of it will kind of be a little bit of experimentation. Like we've got the style frame. Um, 
we have an idea in our head there might be a brief discussion with barton or one of my you know one of the people who's like managing the project um like aaron or chad are two people who are like managing our projects a lot and so we'll bounce creative ideas off each other um and just have like maybe a brief one word discussion about it other other times it's just like just go just just do what you see in your head and i think like for the like the twist one i the concrete twisting uh x one i mm -hmm. like had that idea came to me like late in the day one day and i was about to leave and i i sketched it out on a I sketched it out on a piece of paper and I think my initial, my initial version was going to have the, um, the two like X pieces come and be like sort of offset like this and then have them rip the rock apart going like that. So my initial sketch kind of shows me like showing the two pieces coming together offset like this and then mm. ripping the rock apart. Okay. But then I like, as I was doing it, I was like, actually, what if they came in like this and then twisted and the twisting motion is what happened to the rock. And so a lot of these things, it's like, you, you you more or less come up with an idea of what you're going to do to the thing before you take the thing out of style frame and, and it's like so we're not trying to like recreate the style frame first and then simulate it we're sort of recreating the style frame with lots of leeway to change it with the intent of how we're going to make it move but have that same vibe yeah that's cool no that's really that's it's always yeah i think everybody I think so there's so many different ways to come at things and I, I I think it's always interesting to hear kind of what people's processes are and I think that's a makes sense where you have like a style frame that you're looking at right it's got a general feel and general look and you know a lot of times the people that hand you these things are 2D artists or they're people that are concept or whatever and they might not be really even thinking about what it's going to look like, you know, five seconds before or after this thing. So really, then that becomes our responsibility as, you know, artists to kind of figure out, okay, how do these pieces move? Um, I find that happens so many times with, you know, art directors that come in or whatever and come from the print world that it's, you always have to kind of try to translate for them. And yeah, it makes sense to try to like, okay, how do we translate this now? What What is the way that these things are moving? So. That's cool. That's really great. Yeah. It, it, this was a very straight, like shout out to ESPN. Cause they have an amazing, I've never gotten design frames from a client. We've never seen design frames like these before. We were just like, Oh, okay. Like this is insanely inspiring. Like when you look at these frames, I was just like, Oh, I could do, I could do this. I could like the ideas just flowed out of the frames. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like it. There's so there was so much richness to to the images that it was. They kind of animated themselves almost. Like you're just yeah, like, yeah, just I've got felt, twenty ideas. Yeah, you just felt like that. The answers just came out of the style frames. It was really cool. That's that's always that's always a really nice thing. Um, well, cool, man. Well, hey, Mark, thank you so much uh, for for doing this. It's awesome. Um, I you know, I've learned a lot just watching this is cool, like cool to see, always cool to see another person's, um, you know, thought processes and stuff like that. And um, yeah, it was just, it's just really great. A lot of people are uh, tossing their thank yous in the chat as well. And um, yeah, you know, maybe someday in the not too distant future, if you've got another uh, project that you want to break down or chat about, you know, the, the uh, invitation is always standing. So yeah, for sure. Like, thank you again so much for having me on here. It's a great hang. And uh, yeah, um, it was it was awesome being on here. And I, you know, also thank you. I appreciate all the USD videos that you've been making have been <laughs> saving me in so much pain trying to understand and get over some of these humps that yeah. I have. But like, I, I really do like appreciate all. Well, the, you can um, you can thank side effects for that. Out. That's all. That's yeah. all on the clock. <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of help from the other people there too i'm i i didn't just figure that all out on my, my own so lots yeah, of helpful well, people there so i mean it's just it's put together really nicely too though like it works oh, cool. for my like it's just explained in a very organized way i just it's great so i've Good. been i've been telling other people like this is this is like the guide this is what we this is what this is going to take us into the future <laughs> you know like it's <laughs> <laughs> nice very nice well thank you that's very kind of you as well um 
yeah so hopefully we'll get to do this again soon hopefully i'll get to hang out with you again soon we we saw each other in uh in texas a little earlier this year so that was pretty fun and yeah. um yeah hopefully our paths will cross again in the not too distant future but um yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna cut cut you free here uh let you go um and uh uh we can maybe chat a little bit offline afterwards but um but yeah so thank you again so much for being here and um yeah for everybody else that is uh that's joined us tonight thank you for being part of uh the stream tonight um mark's work obviously is very inspiring and uh hopefully you got something good out of it and um yeah we'll we'll see you guys uh next time and uh thanks for joining bye everybody